Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. And thank you for joining us today. I'm coming to you from sunny Fontana, California. My name is Linda Williams, and I am a community outreach and training manager with Consumer Action. And in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on the double pandemic, domestic violence and financial abuse in age of COVID-19. Consumer Action would like to join communities across our country in celebrating the tremendous progress made over the past years to address the needs of domestic violence survivors. But there is much, much more work to be done. I think you would agree with me when I say the COVID-19 pandemic shines a huge, huge spotlights on numerous ongoing public health crises in America, including intimate partner abuse, domestic violence, and financial abuse. But on a lighter note, we have a great webinar planned for you today. We have led by two great subject matter experts, Macklin Stanley of the Law Office of Macklin Stanley and Gretchen Shaw, Deputy Director of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. You are in for a real treat today. Today's webinar will cover the correlation between crises like COVID-19 and increased incidence of domestic violence, domestic violence impact on the economic and social environment of families. We're gonna take a look at COVID's relationship to other fam family dynamics like child abuse, divorce, and elder neglect how to identify economic abuse and why it matters, combating coerced debt, housing and domestic violence, and much, much more. Today's webinar is part of a series of webinars that Consumer Action is hosting in response to the COVID-19 crisis. Consumer Action's work on the COVID-19 project is made possible by a grant from Wells Fargo. So on behalf of the entire staff at uh, Consumer Action, we would like to thank Wells Fargo uh, for their support. Now, before I'm moving into the program, I need to go over a few housekeeping tips, and I would like to introduce you to Consumer Action. As the announcer stated when you joined the webinar, you are in listen-only mode. However, if you have questions, and we hope you have tons and tons of questions, you can use the question function uh, to the uh, right of your screen. If you will take a few seconds to find uh, that function, uh, open it, click on it, open it up so you are ready to go. If you're on Twitter, you can use that platform to ask your questions. Our organization handle is at Consumer Action, or you can just use our go-to hashtag, which is CA Webinars. My colleague, Nelson Santiago, will facilitate the question and answer segment following um, both presentations. Uh, and he will capture all of your questions, including those on Twitter. The webinar is being recorded. All handouts will be placed in a Dropbox and made available to you tomorrow afternoon. Now, you don't need to have a Dropbox. We are providing the Dropbox. All you need to do is click on the link. This training is certified for 1.5 continuing education units for uh, the Association for Financial Counseling and Planning Education. So at the end of the webinar, just submit your uh, paperwork to get those credits. At the end of our training, you will receive a survey about today's webinar. Please complete the survey before signing up. The survey is very important to us. It helps us continue doing the work that we're doing. Now, what do we do with Consumer Action? Well, if you look at the words on the screen under Welcome to Consumer Action, through education and advocacy, Consumer Action fights for strong consumer rights and policies that promote fairness and financial prosperity for underrepresented consumers nationwide. How do we do it? By referring complaints to our national hotline, by publishing educational materials in multiple languages through our monthly newsletter, The Insider, our quarterly publication, CA News, and by advocating for consumers in the media and for lawmakers. We've been around since 1971. In fact, we just celebrated our 49th anniversary. So a special thanks, a shout out to all of you who joined us for our virtual community empowerment convening. It was a very successful event, thanks to all of you. Now, there's so many agencies joining us today that are new to consumer action. So I thought I would take just a few seconds to show you how to download our free educational materials that could be really important, instrumental to your clients now who are struggling to make ends meet on unemployment. So let's say that you are seeing a lot of ID, ID theft cases. 
uh, more than usual since COVID has hit and you are interested in a training module, you go to our website. Our address is on all the materials that you sent, that we sent you, and you go over to our quick menu. You go down to select a training model and click. As soon as you click, you will be led to a list of publications that we created that's related to ID theft. For an example, you will find a backgrounders guide in question and answer format, a lesson plan with learning objectives and step-by-step -step instructions on how to use it, along with PowerPoint slides that we created. And guess what? We have notes and uh, talking points in a note section that will help you through. And if you look, very carefully, you'll see an ID theft quiz that I created that you can download and use to engage your audience and test their knowledge about identity theft. Now, if you're interested in our COVID-19 pro uh, pro project, just click uh, in the dark green button and then it will lead you to our COVID-19 uh, page. When you're on the page, if you click on the words resource guide, you will find valuable resources for consumers impacted by COVID-19 in different languages. If you're looking for fact sheets, just click on the words fact sheets and then you will find one like the one to the, to the right, making a job, a career transition, or one on fair housing, one on estate planning. If you're interested in webinars, uh, you can click on the word webinar and you will it will take you to some of our past webinars like the one on fair housing COVID-19 scams and medical fraud now we are a 501c3 organizations we are supported by membership donations and grants so at the end of the webinar there will be information about how you can make a donation to consumer action so let's take a quick look at look at the agenda at Consumer Action, we believe in making learning fun. So we open up every training, whether it's in-person or virtual, with um, with our popular game, How Much Do You Know? And that's our chance to test your knowledge on the topics of the, uh, the, topics of the training. We have four poll questions for you today. Following the game, we will move into the featured presentation, and then my coworker, Nelson Santiago, would come on, and that's when he will present your questions to uh, our guest speakers. Once the session is over, I will come back, tell you how you can donate to Consumer Action, and then I'll wrap up. So let's let the games begin. Alex Trebek, launch that first poll question. Okay, one in five women and one in seven men report having experienced severe physical violence from an intimate partner in their lifetime. One in five, one in seven men, is that true or is that false? Don't overthink it, don't overthink it. Okay, let's close the poll and see the results. Wow, 88% think it's true, 12% think it's false. Well, according to the CDC's fact sheet on pre preventing intimate partner violence, that is true. So let's move to the next question. One study found that 75% of women and domestic violence shelters have stayed with an abuser longer due to financial concerns. 75%, is that true? Is that false? Okay, let's close the poll. See the results. Wow, 100% of you think it's true? 100% of you think it's true? Well, you're right, it is true. According to a report released by the Center for American Progress just last August, one study found that 75% of women stayed longer due to financial concerns. And that study was conducted by the Mary Kay Foundation. Let's move to the next question. One point five million high school boys and girls admit to being physically harmed last year by someone they were romantically involved with. One point million? Is that true or is that false? Don't overthink it. One point five million? <laughs> 
Okay, let's close the polls. The seed of results. 91% think it's true, only 9% think it's false. Actually, that is true. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and an organization called loversrespect.org and the CDC, that is absolutely true. How many of you have high school kids? Okay, last question. In the LGBTQ community, IVP, intimate partner violence, occur at a rate equal to or even higher than that of a heterosexual community. Is that true or is that false? Don't overthink it. Is that true or is that false? Okay, let's close the poll. Let's see the results. Wow, 94% of you think it's true, 6% think it's false. Actually, that's true. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, it is absolutely true. Thank you so much for uh, participating uh, in the game. I, I, I hope you enjoy playing along, but let me put you on notice not right now. You did a great job. Next time I will come up with more difficult questions because you answer those with ease. Now we're gonna move into our, um, featured presentation. I would like to introduce to you our first guest speaker. Our first speaker today is Macklin Stanley. He is a Harvard Law School graduate and practicing attorney in California. He currently runs a law firm dedicated to pursuing claims of sexual assault, sexual harassment, and gender discrimination. He is also a special advisor to the Harvard Law School Gender Violence Program. Prior to his legal practice, he received a master's in education in developmental psychology from Harvard's Graduate School of Education, and he's taught courses in psychology 101 at a community college in New York. During his graduate studies, he authored several peer-reviewed scientific articles in psychology journals and presented numerous guest lectures at various universities. He's primarily interested in, ver in the various intersections between law and psychology, neuroscience. He is the author of Making Sense of Chaos, The Psychology of a Chaotic World. A few of his most recent posts are NFL Loses, Losses are associated with increased domestic violence. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a dandelion and the bizarre legal loopholes surrounding spousal rapes. We are honored to have Mr. Stanley with us today. We're also honored to have with us today Gretchen Shaw. Ms. Shaw currently serves as the Deputy Director of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, where she has worked since, she moved, since moving to Denver from Alabama in 2000. Her experience reflects a background of developing and directing programs and project grant writing and research, event planning, administration, and management. In collaboration with the National Organization for Men Against Sexism and the Women's Health Center, she helped research, write, and produce exposing reproductive coercion, a toolkit for awareness, raising, assessment, and intervention. She also directed and she directed the development and production of Take a Stand for Healthy Relationships, an initiative to teach students how to understand and build healthy relationships, reject violence, abuse, and safely advocate for themselves and others if experiencing it abuse. Michelle also developed a teen dating violence prevention curriculum, a resource on teen dating violence and healthy relationship targeted to our school educators. She currently manages several projects for the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and that agency's financial empowerment program. Without further ado, let me turn this program over to Mr. Stanley. You have control. All right. Well, let me make sure I have control here to check. Can move the slides. There we go. It does seem to be able to work. Great. Well, Linda, thank you for that introduction. I'm sure my colleague, Ms. Shaw, would agree that you made a sound mm -hmm. even cooler than we ever think we possibly are. So I would like to bring <laughs> you around with me everywhere I go in order to <laughs> tell people all the things I've done. So thank you for that.
Um, as mentioned, today I'm going to talk about domestic violence, in particular domestic violence during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to talk about a few different things. The significant upticks we've seen during COVID-19, some of the reasons behind those upticks, and also just some legal issues surrounding domestic violence um, right now during the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns and all sorts of court closures and, and difficulties that people might be experiencing. So um, I don't need to do an about me because Linda did a great job already, so I don't need to talk about that. Uh, one thing I will note is um, at my yeah, my law practice, I, I specialize primarily, uh, especially lately, in, in pursuing sexual assault rape cases in the civil system. Um, I do that because some survivors of rape tend to find the criminal system uh, doesn't offer them the justice that they are looking for, whether it's not expedient enough or several problems there. And, and the civil system is another route to take claims of sexual assault. That's kind of my, my bread and butter and what, what I focus on the most. Um, not really as related to this, but something that might elicit questions or people might be interested in. But other than that, everything's here. Linda's already discussed. So thank you. Thank you for that. I know I'm just a a voice here. I don't, my webcam's not even on, so I'm glad we have some context to uh, who I am and who Ms. Shaw is. So that was very nice of you. So let's jump right into it. First thing I want to do is talk about some of the social and psychological effects of COVID-19. Um, I will be throwing out a lot of studies, a lot of numbers, so bear with me. I hope it doesn't fall flat, but I think there are very important numbers um, very important studies to really contextualize the severity of COVID-19 and the associated lockdowns and how it's really affecting our social and psychological um, parts of life. So I think it's fair to say that every negative outcome of life and every negative variable that you can think of has kind of been made worse by COVID-19. Certainly there's exceptions, but if you think of something that's a bad outcome in life, COVID-19 has probably made that increase lately. For example, divorce is something that many surveys have shown is, is tending to increase over the last several months. Some studies have shown that um, on different websites, around 25%, uh, the, the traffic has increased about 25% on websites searching for divorce and divorce-related information. Um, with depression, uh, with depression, one recent study looked at around 1,500 participants in the U.S. and found that depression symptoms were three times higher during the COVID-19 pandemic than they were before the pandemic. Uh, the depression rates in, uh, among participants in this study were around 8%, whereas, I'm sorry, the depression rates in participants is normally around 8%, but in this study, they were 25%. So we saw a significant increase from the baseline of 8% to 25% during COVID-19. And that was actually a similar rate to the rates you uh, would see after the 9-11 attacks. So very, very significant uptick there. Suicide has likewise increased. One recent study looked at participants and asked if they had considered suicide within the last 30 days, actually if they had seriously considered suicide within the last 30 days, and around twice as many people than you would normally expect responded that yes, they had um, seriously considered suicide in the last 30 days. Isolation is also a huge problem. We should consider the 28% uh, of Americans who currently live alone. And I don't know if anyone watching today lives alone, but certainly you are seeing a very uh, significant decrease in human contact, less social interaction, less in-person communications, and even just less physical touch. I just read an article uh, a day ago about the psychological importance of just tactile sensations of human beings, of touch, and the hugs we're missing out of, the, the handshakes that we're missing. And, and when you live alone, um, certainly all of those problems are exacerbated. And some studies have shown that the perception of loneliness has tended to increase around 20 to 30 percent during COVID. Now we'll get into increased substance abuse. The CDC has put out a report saying that there's been an 18 percent increase in drug overdoses. It's a big country here. A lot of states are doing better or worse than others, but I just happen to notice that Georgia in particular 
has seen a 60% increase in overdose deaths due to opioids. So a very stark uptick in increased substance use. And we're going to talk about alcohol use in a moment. Unemployment, definitely a concern. Um, we've seen some improvements lately. Um, but there was a time there, I believe back in April, when unemployment rates hit the highest levels since the Great Depression. Definitely a uh, significant problem. Global poverty, the WHO has made a big deal of this. I read they rightly should. They put out many reports mentioning that around 70 to 100 million people will enter into extreme poverty throughout the globe. Um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's really a shame because if anyone's experienced with this, global poverty throughout the world has actually really improved over the last few decades. Standard of living has improved, GDP has gone up in almost every country. Um, so it's really a, a, a huge shame that there's been a big setback to that through COVID-19. In fact, it's predicted that this year will be the first time global poverty rates have increased since 1998. Um, and lastly, we'll just touch on learning loss. Obviously, with virtual learning, things are difficult. Some students are not even registering for school as often as they should, uh, whether that's because their parents elect to take them out of school or they elect to work jobs to help support their families during these difficult times, high school students in particular. But some new studies have shown that students are only gaining about 70% of the reading education that they would normally derive in one year. And for math, it's even worse. Students are only gaining about 50% of their math education through virtual learning and other avenues that we currently have. So simply put, students are going to end up behind in their learning. Uh, we should also acknowledge the social development costs um, for children not being able to socially interact with their, with their playmates at school and their friends. Certainly the parent disruption of students not being at school and what that means for parents and their jobs. And of course, there's just a plethora of issues as, as, as finite, as, as specific, I should say, as um, some districts, school districts, have a 99% reliance on school lunches to provide food for those students. So this 99% of students need the provided school lunches to eat that afternoon. And that's a problem in and of itself with schools being closed. So there's a lot of problems here. I wanted to just start with that to really contextualize the severity of COVID-19 and what it means for our social and psychological development. And of course, there's definitely more than this. These were just a few issues I wanted to touch on at the onset. So moving on, a quick note about terminology. Um, domestic violence can mean a lot of different things. I think my colleague, Ms. Shaw, might even define it differently than I'm going to, which is totally fair. She's probably more correct than I am. But what domestic violence means versus what intimate partner violence means, um, sometimes these these terms are used synonymously in the literature and among practitioners, and sometimes they're very distinct. It kind of, it kind of depends. I think there's been a trend towards using intimate partner violence as the actual correct verbiage, but, but, but they mean different things. Legally speaking, domestic violence in statutes and in legal codes tends to mean physical violence among people who cohabitate together. It can mean children, parent-children violence. It can mean um, it can mean anyone who lives in a household together experiencing violence inflicted upon the people in that same household. That's legally speaking, and that depends on the code you're looking at, but that, that's a common instance. Uh, but domestic violence in the broader sense can also mean emotional violence. It can, it can mean so many things. Intimate partner violence typically means violence among intimate partners who are in a relationship, independent of if they're cohabitating or not. So for the purpose of my discussion with COVID-19, I'm going to define domestic violence as physical violence among intimate partners who live together, uh, because the living together aspect of this is, is kind of very salient with COVID-19. So what I talk about the studies I'm going to talk about and the effects I'm talking about, I'm mostly talking about uh, spouses, boyfriend and girlfriend who live together and are in, in, in an intimate relationship. So again, Michelle might even describe it differently, but that, that's what I'm going to basically talk about today. So let's get right into it. There has definitely been a stark increase 
in domestic violence during COVID-19. And it's important to note, this is a global phenomenon. This is not just the U.S. that's having a problem with this. Everyone is having a problem with this. I would say that some countries are actually doing even worse than us. But you can see Singapore, Argentina, France, Australia, um, the United Kingdom in particular, and from what I've researched, has seemed to have a very difficult time with this. In one month, I believe it was in April, their uh, domestic violence homicides were 200% higher than they would normally expect in that month. But and then there's another, um, there's, a, there's a domestic violence advocacy organization in the UK called Respect. It's kind of their most prominent organization. And they track their web traffic and their website visits and emails. And throughout the pandemic, they've seen a huge increase in calls to their organization, almost 200% increase in emails, and a 581% increase in website visits. So that is a incredible increase. And it really spans the globe. So I wanted to just make that clear. This is not just the United States. There, this is happening throughout the world. Now, just a quick pause while we think about that first set of data is to think about how are people seeking help right now? How are survivors and victims of domestic abuse seeking help? We're going to talk about this more in a minute. But quarantines, whether they're state sanctioned or just publicly pressured to quarantine in your household. It's this idea of forced togetherness. And of course, victims are now trapped with their abusive partners. I'm sure we've all thought about this already, but we'll just jump into it now. The typical routes for asking for help have been totally shut down, or at least significantly shut down. Visiting friends and family to escape a violent household has become very difficult. Shelters where domestic violence victims go to flee um, are having their own huge problems with, with the contagion risks and, and putting survivors and victims in, in these dorm-like settings that it has its own problems. Um, so one interesting thing that European countries have done, in particular France and Spain, they actually created an initiative um, with pharmacies and pharmacists that they kind of came up with this idea that that victims of abuse can use special code words when they go to the pharmacy to signal that they're having domestic violence problems and they need help. Um, the code words were things like mask 19 or other innocuous sounding words. And it's interesting because as we know, the pharmacy is a place where we can still go during the pandemic. It's an essential business for medications we need, things like that. And you can use an innocuous word like a mask 19 or something like that, that, that the abuser might not even pick up that you're doing something, um, but the pharmacist will understand that you're looking for help and can per perhaps direct you to the correct resources you need. So I just thought that was an interesting tidbit to share how effective that has been. I'm not sure, but I, I read about it and I thought it might be interesting for everyone to know that there have been some creative and innovative uh, attempts to, to kind of handle domestic violence during the pandemic. And we'll talk more about some of those creative and innovative ideas. Now, let's get into the United States. Um, certainly, we are seeing an increase in domestic violence. We could probably, you know, I've read so many studies, so many, I'm sorry, articles that have talked about similarly huge upticks in domestic violence. I've read them on the New York Times, the Washington Post, local news organizations, a lot of anecdotal evidence of massive increases in domestic violence. And, and while those are, are likely all true, something that's happened now is we've been in the pandemic for long enough that data has accumulated uh, long enough that we can publish papers in peer-reviewed journals and actually show demonstrable evidence of actual upticks in, in domestic violence, calls to police, criminal charges, self-reporting, all sorts of things are now peer-reviewed and published and show that this is truly um, a fact. It's not just an article reporting, and now it's, it's really hard data. One study uh, examined 14 metropolitan areas, and of course, as we talked about, they found a 10 to 15 percent increase in calls to police regarding domestic violence. Another study looked at Los Angeles and Indianapolis in particular, and they looked at the number of overall crimes being reported. And likewise, they found a 15 to 20% increase in domestic violence. What's very interesting is other crimes actually either stayed the same or decreased during this examination period. So there's something unique 
about domestic violence and its increase during the pandemic. Here's the, the chart from that study. Now, full disclosure, I'm not a mathematician, but this, this, tape, this, this uh, column I've highlighted, um, I think they employed some kind of regression analysis. I actually tried my best to understand exactly how the math worked, but I think it's fair to say we can call this percentages. Don't quote me on that, but that's, my, that's what I gleaned from it at least. So we can see in this chart, burglary went down 19% during the examination period, which makes intuitive sense. People are at home more often. Uh, criminals are, might not burglarize a residence as often when they know everyone is home. That makes sense. More surprisingly, robberies went down slightly, about 4 to 2, two to 4 percent. But assault and batteries stayed the same, uh, slight, slight decrease, but not st uh, st statistically significant. Um, so we can just say that stayed the same. So that's what's very interesting. Assault and batteries, non-domestic, stayed the same. But we go down here to domestic violence, that increased by around 13%. So there really is this specific domestic-related violence that is, is proliferating during COVID. Um, Unrelatedly, completely, but traffic stops, we can see huge decrease in traffic stops, 200% decrease in traffic stops, which, you know, that's also kind of intuitive. Um, there's less people out on the road driving. Um, I think police are also just very much preoccupied with a global pandemic and the civil unrest we've also seen at the same time. Um, I've seen that in my own personal life. I don't see as many police, you know, hiding under the overpass trying to catch you. So that, that makes sense to me. Um, certainly would not advise anyone ever speed, but if you were going to do it, you might get away with it now, but you shouldn't do it anyways. So um, strikingly, domestic violence is not just more prevalent, it's also more severe. One study, again, peer reviewed data came out from a Boston hospital and they found. Again, they saw about two times more domestic violence patients than they would normally see, so the, the prevalence increased, but the injuries were also dramatically more severe. Um, you know, I, I actually have, uh, my, my mother-in-law is a judge in Alabama, she, she deals with domestic violence cases frequently, and she kind of corroborates this, it's anecdotal, but she's seen some very severe injuries um, in court and people who have been inflicted uh, with domestic violence and then just, you know, total anecdotal, but uh, it, it's in real world, you know, she sees victims in court that have been really physically severely harmed and it, it's really a problem. So the researchers in this study, they hypothesize what's causing this increase in severity of violence. It could be the victims are delaying care, which is an important thing to discuss. We've all heard about it in the news. People are not going to their primary care physicians as often or physicals and checkups. We've heard a lot about cancer screenings being undone and, and the problems with that. Um, you know, so that's something that, that could be considered the victims just delayed as long as they could. No one wants to go to the hospital right now. They don't want to risk being around COVID. I think that's, that's something we're all familiar with. Or maybe the violence has just escalated. It's kind of hard to tell what was the causal factor here, but those were the two suggestions from the researchers. This is a chart from the study showing the organ involved in the injury. Um, you see the last four years of data here from 2017 to 2020. And you'll see that the, the organ involved in the injury oddly happens to be the chest and the abdomen this year has seen a very significant increase in injury. And the researchers mentioned that they've seen an unusually high number of stabbings. Um, so very, very problematic data that we're looking at. It is extremely problematic because very severe physical injury is, is highly, highly correlated with eventual homicide. There's a lot of different studies on this, a lot of different numbers. I think the highest number I've ever seen is 900%. Basically, once the threshold has been crossed where an abuser inflicts serious physical violence on a victim, once that threshold has been hit, the chance of being actually killed by that abuser skyrockets. Um, so the fact that we're seeing not just more prevalent abuse, but more serious abuse is, is really something to be concerned about and something to look out for. Um, just a, a unfortunate 
statistic. If you look at all of the females who are murdered in the United States every year, about half of those murders are done by intimate partners or family members. Um, sad statistic, but something we should all be aware of. Now, this is definitely alarming. That is, that is definitely the case. This is an alarming rise in domestic violence. This is a tweet from Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, back in April, expressing alarm at the reported increase in domestic violence incidents in his state. But for people who are practitioners and researchers or otherwise just familiar with domestic violence, it's not necessarily surprising. Um, and this is why. Domestic violence, I would say, is like a weed. It needs very little to grow. And some of my articles for Psych Today and just doing some research for this presentation, I looked at some factors that seem to be positively associated with domestic violence. And it's quite frankly shocking to see how little domestic violence needs to grow. Um, holidays are a big one. Um, this study that with the data referenced here looked at uh, the percentage of domestic violence calls to police. And on Memorial Day, July 4th, we see 30% increase in calls to police for domestic violence. Things as innocuous as we think as, as weather being hot. When it's hotter than 80 degrees outside, domestic violence calls to police go up 8%. And uh, a most recent thing I looked at, which is just, you know, depressing, is how much sports can affect domestic violence. One study from 2011 looked at criminal data sets of the crimes reported throughout the country and compared them to NFL's uh, scheduling on Sunday. So when NFL teams are playing on Sunday, they, they compared the crime data versus those days. And they found that when NFL teams experience an upset loss, which they defined as a team is supposed to win, but they end up not winning, um, calls to police for domestic violence increased 10%. And interestingly, those calls to police were very, time-wise, were very specific. They occurred right at the end of the game, like a 30-minute window. They were also more prevalent when it was a playoff game or a rivalry game. So very strong evidence that these calls to police that increased happened at the right time that we would expect and during the most um, important games. Um, and if we look at the United Kingdom, Anyone who has friends in the United Kingdom or in Europe in general, we know they take their football, which we call soccer, uh, very seriously over there. They're kind of fanatics about it. And there's a study from the United Kingdom that shows when the national football team is playing and when they lose, calls for domestic violence tend to increase 38% throughout the country. So really startling stuff and important to note how little it takes for domestic violence to increase. Among all of those things, there's one particular area that has been widely noted as increasing domestic violence, and that is natural disasters and natural crises. The World Health Organization has taken a lot of effort, or have really undertaken an effort to demonstrate how much domestic violence increases during times of national distress and crises. They've authored several reports on this issue. And again, natural disasters tend to increase the frequency and intensity of domestic violence. The WHO has um, shown, you know, volcanic eruptions have, have elicited this effect throughout the world. The earthquake in Haiti in 2010 showed increases in domestic violence. The tsunami in Indonesia in 2004 showed increases in domestic violence. Um, you know, any big crises you can think of, you're likely to find domestic violence has increased. When we look at recent examples in the United States, we see similar effects with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill not too long ago. A stud that one study examined women who were directly impacted by the spill and saw that they were more likely to experience domestic violence. Hurricane Katrina, this was an interesting study. Researchers examined about 100 women following the hurricane, and they found that women who experienced more damage from the storm, so their personal property was damaged, their business was damaged, they experienced financial stress due to damage, um, those women, or I'm sorry, the, the damage, the level of damage experienced by those women was positively associated with the likelihood of increased domestic violence. 
and Hurricane Harvey, I believe the most recent hurricane that was that I can find a study on, um, likewise showed significant increases in domestic violence. Now, taking a look at one of the reports from Hurricane Harvey, this just goes back to the idea that the violence has also become more severe, not just more prevalent. But um, this chart, it's kind of not very intuitive when you look at it immediately, so I'll just explain it. It shows the amount of strangulation filings that occur during domestic violence situations, so how many strangulations there have been. And in 2017, we see the number on the left side column in Harris County, which is where Houston is. There's about 1,400 instances of strangulations in domestic violence cases. Um, now we look at the post-Harvey side on the right, and this is only halfway through 2018. This is only in July of 2018. And we've already seen it surpass the 2017 numbers. Um, it's only halfway through the year. So it really does show, again, another source of evidence showing that violence tends to also uh, become more severe in times of national disasters and crises, which is COVID-19 we are currently living through. So why? Why has there been an increase in domestic violence during COVID-19? Is it the quarantine? Is it this idea of forced togetherness and victims being unable to leave their homes and find help? the forcing people to be together and not letting emotions cool, more causes of conflict, more opportunities for conflict, or is it the national crises, is it the stressors elicited by COVID-19? Um, I think the answer is yes to both of those questions, but I also think it's too simple to just say it's, it's these things. I think what's needed is, is a multifactorial and reciprocal, reciprocal explanation. So, what I think is happening is we can look at all of the most, all of the factors that are most commonly associated with domestic violence outside of the pandemic. And we just look at the literature and we see what are these factors that are most related to domestic violence? There's several of them, but I would argue that those same factors, stress is the first one. Those same factors are really being catalyzed by COVID-19. Um, it, and then it's the combination of these common domestic violence factors being precipitated by COVID-19 combined with the quarantine and the forced togetherness that is really creating the perfect storm for domestic violence to skyrocket. So let's talk a little bit about those factors. So the first one is stress. Sure, it's intuitive that stress is commonly associated with, with domestic violence. And certainly, natural disasters and crises catalyze immense stress responses. We can look back to the Hurricane Katrina study I just mentioned, where the, the amount of damage, which I think is a good indicator of stress one experiences, was positively associated with the likelihood of experiencing domestic violence. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic is actually more stressful than a lot of other disasters like hurricanes or earthquakes. Because with those disasters, there is at least an established time boundary from which we can assess damage, pick up our lives, and, and regroup and, and, and try to get back to normal. But with, with a virus pandemic, we're kind of in this ongoing state of anxiety and worry. Um, and I think that that can elicit stress hormones like cortisol, being in this persistent state of anxiety and worry of, am I going to get affected? Have, uh, have I been infected already? Um, and there's lots of studies showing that cortisol and various stress hormones are very, very much associated with aggression. So I think this particular pandemic is really um, a source of stress, and stress likewise can be associated with increased domestic violence. Isolation, we've already touched on, but isolation is probably the most common tactic employed by per perpetrators of domestic violence. Um, by isolating friends, by isolating victims from friends and family and any outside contact, abusers can really assert control over the victim's entire environment, which will lead to the normalization of abuse. It can cause victims to even rely on their abusers to define a sense of reality. But now isolation is, is socially imposed. And at a time when the lockdowns were, were more present, it was state sanctioned even. Um, 
So that's definitely something here that, you know, it's always been a problem, this isolation factor. Now COVID-19 has brought that to light and, and abusers don't even need to try to isolate. It's already happening for them. Economic anxiety, we talked about. This is definitely a, a factor highly associated with domestic violence. And I think it's actually one of the most studied areas that I've personally seen. Um, there's been numerous studies showing that uh, domestic violence is more likely in households that are economically distressed. Um, studies from the 2008 recession found that increased unemployment claims were correlated with a greater number of reported cases of domestic violence. And as we discussed, COVID-19 has certainly elicited unprecedented job loss comparable to, to levels of, of almost the Great Depression. So one interesting tidbit here is researchers have discussed is the threat to the masculine identity kind of underlies this relationship between economic anxiety and domestic violence. And it's pretty much the thought that the failure to provide for the family, the failure to be the breadwinner, threatens the masculine identity. And in order to regain control in a relationship, abusers will resort to violence in order to gain the upper hand because that's all they have left. So um, lots of research in that area. Alcohol is definitely a strong predictor of domestic violence. That's because of its disinhibitory effect on aggression. Basically, alcohol inhibits your ability, your ability to regulate aggression. And as the nation has sheltered at home, we've seen alcohol sales increase dramatically. I saw one survey say that alcohol sales have increased 243%, which mimics trends from past national disasters. We saw trends um, of increases in alcohol sales during Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Harvey, the normal thing that happens. Um, lack of mental health services. COVID-19 is definitely having less people go to their counseling appointments and therapy appointments, just like their regular medical checkups. And, you know, abusers can rely on those mental health services to, to help mitigate their aggressive tendencies. Likewise, victims rely on those counseling sessions to help, um, you know, make sense of the trauma that they are experiencing. And like all forms of medicine, uh, medical appointments, I think counseling has taken a big hit. It's luckily, I think, the easiest form of, of help that can be turned virtual. But that being said, there's still been declines in people um, going to their mental health appointments. And just last one is a lack of resources for survivors. Um, COVID-19, I'm sure Ms. Ms. Shaw will talk about this further, um, has had a huge effect on advocacy organizations, their ability to provide aid. Things have to be virtual now. Shelters, which are such a pivotal, pivotal place for, for survivors to go to flee an abusive area and, and find, you know, a, a respite from uh, the problems they're facing. Um, those are having their own issues because of the virus and having people grouped closely together. And I represent um, pro bono an advocacy organization actually right now, and they're having big problems because their funding has just diminished completely. People are all diverting their, their donations to public health initiatives due to COVID. So their funding has just completely dried up on top of all of the other problems they're already having. So all of that said, I'll go back to this. It's kind of just the perfect storm of, of factors related to domestic violence that COVID-19 is precipitating combined with the forced togetherness and the, in, the lack of opportunities for survivors to, to find help. It's really just this perfect scenario. Um, I'm gonna skip the triggering events uh, because I have a habit of talking way too much and I put a timer on and I'm already at 30 minutes and I am fulfilling my own prophecy of talking too much. So I'm gonna skip this, but the point is, um, there's been uh, criminologists and psychologists who, who have homicide timelines and they go through eight steps um, that kind of show the steps involved when, when homicides take place. And it's been applied to domestic violence homicides. And one of the biggest factors is, is the triggering event, something that where the abusers um, lose control and it precipitates the ongoing violence that's going and it, it escalates from there. And I would just argue that COVID has unleashed countless trigger, triggering events. And now there's no escape for survivors. If you're more interested in that timeline, I know these slides will be shared. You can look up the, the researchers and the timeline um, by yourself.
Now, where are we now? I think we are in a bad place. Um, I think domestic violence rates were already very high. In fact, that was one of our very uh, uh, astute questions at the onset of this of this webinar is, is how many people experience sexual violence just normally, and it's one in five women experience sexual violence. Um, around 10 million people are abused by intimate partners every year. So domestic violence was already a large problem. Um, and now COVID-19 is exacerbating that. And something that I think worth mentioning is gun sales have exploded. You can't even buy a gun in some places because they're flying off the shelf. And maybe Ms. Shaw will have more info about this. I haven't seen any studies mentioning that homicides, domestic homicides have increased yet. I don't know if the data just hasn't had time to accumulate, or maybe it has and I just hasn't seen it, or maybe it hasn't happened. I certainly hope that's the case. But I do think we might see a very unfortunate um, outcome here where homicides will also possibly increase in, in, the, in the year as it wraps up here. I certainly hope I'm wrong. So I'm going to skip this slide a little bit too because I talk too much, but I just want to mention that COVID has had effects on other domestic issues. It's important to note that violence against children has also increased. We already talked about divorce. Elder abuse and neglect has likewise seen some increases. So this domestic issue within the household, COVID has really had an effect on it. Um, and it, that's just important to understand. So let's wrap up here with, with legal issues. There's a few more slides here. And the question is, looking at the legal landscape, how have things changed during COVID-19? Um, the unfortunate answer is it really depends when it comes to domestic violence. Domestic violence laws and regulations are very jurisdictional dependent. It will depend on the state you're in, the county, the city, and even the judge presiding over the matter. It really, really depends. But if I were to give a global opinion on what's happened, I think a lot of positive things have happened. I think a lot of courts have um, started putting protective orders on online platforms. So people, instead of having to go to court to fill out these protective orders, they can be done online. I think it was Riverside County here in California. I'm, I'm from California. Uh, I think it was Riverside. I actually looked at their online portal to, to, to file a protective order and it was actually quite intuitive. I, I was fairly impressed. Um, other things have happened where emergency protective orders have just been extended. The default length of time has been extended. Temporary restraining orders, uh, the default length of time has also been extended in order to give people a chance here with this domestic violence during the pandemic. Your state might define things differently. California has emergency protective orders, temporary restraining orders, and restraining orders. Uh, your state's domestic violence restraining orders might have different terminology, but I, I would guess that they have been extended or they've moved to online. Um, it's also important to note that even when courts are closed, they're still open for emergency services. Um, obviously, judges and, and, and lawyers have to be around for emergency problems, even during the pandemic. So they've always actually been open for restraining order filings, at least in my experience, they've always been open. Um, but the problem is, do victims know that the courts are open? They hear that everything's closed and they think they're out of luck, but that, that, that's something also to note. At least the courts that I've seen, they've always stayed open for emergency issues, at least. Two last things. Two questions that have been asked of me recently that I thought were interesting that I would like to share. Someone asked me about the moratorium on evictions. Right now at the state and federal level, there are a bunch of moratoriums on evictions. You cannot evict people due to the pandemic. And someone asked me, if my partner is being abusive and violent, um, can they still be evicted from my, from my apartment? Because I need them to go. What, what do I do? I think COVID made eviction stop. And what normally could happen is a landlord can bifurcate a lease and if there's two people on a lease, they can split it in half, so to say, and evict the violent abuser and allow the victim to still stay at the apartment or house or whatever it is. Um, that can still happen, even with the, uh, the moratoriums right now. Check your state uh, laws and your state you know, specific issues. Again, this is very jurisdictionally dependent, but most that I've seen, these moratoriums still have exemptions for criminal activities. You can still evict someone who's been engaged in criminal behavior and domestic violence, it counts as criminal behaviors and can still be evicted in that sense. The last thing I've been asked about is voter registration concerns, privacy concerns. 
I didn't really know this until I looked it up, but um, when you register to vote, it can actually make your address public. That's because political campaigns and things like that will want to use your address, or it at least makes your address much more easy to find. And of course, victims of not even domestic violence, but sexual assaults or stalking, they don't want their address public. They don't want it to be able to be found by their abuser or someone who knows their abuser, and that's a big problem. Um, fortunately, most states now have address confidentiality programs that will allow you to keep your address confidential even when you register to vote. It's state specific, check your state's laws, your state advocacy organization to figure out if that is a problem you're having and how to handle it. But most states do have a way to still keep your address confidential, which is really important in this time of voting um, right now as November is, is coming along. So that is it. These are some sources at the end of my slides. If you would like to look at them later, this is a contact page uh, for myself and but we don't need that and I took too much time so thank you for listening and I look forward to hearing what uh, Ms. Shaw has to say. Thank you Mr. Stanley. Let me turn the presentation over to Ms. Shaw. Give me one second. There you go Ms. Shaw and I'm glad you have a picture on your slides. Thank you so <laughs> much for putting add in that picture. Thank you. Sure no problem. Let me make sure this is working. Mm -hmm. Yep yeah, okay whoops I'm gonna go back. So, Mr. Stanley, thank you so much for that. That was a fantastic presentation, um, and you will do just fine during Q and A. You're very well educated around this issue, and I, you know, will prove to just reiterate a lot of the points you made throughout your presentation. Thank you also to uh, Consumer Action for having me here today. I really appreciate it. Again, my name is Gretchen Shaw. I'm the Deputy Director here at NCDB. I've been working in the domestic violence movement for I think around 22 years. So while I wish I were an expert on every single aspect of dom domestic violence, um, unfortunately I'm not. I will certainly do my best to give you as much information as I can throughout this presentation. So I just wanted to take a minute to uh, give you a brief overview of NCADV. We are the nation's um, oldest national grassroots domestic violence organization, and we exist to provide educational opportunities, information and resources to survivors of domestic violence. We educate the public and provide training opportunities for advocates. We mobilize uh, leaders and lawmakers at the federal level to support federal legislation that empowers victims and survivors. Um, we currently are the only national grassroots organization focused solely on domestic violence that does not receive government funding, so we are quite dependent on the generosity of donors, uh, grantors, and partnerships. And we're survivor-led, and we, we take their experiences and their information to direct our work. So our goal is to create a world in which we're all safe, empowered, and free from domestic violence, and particularly that uh, offenders are held accountable. Additionally, we are holding our 19th National Conference on Domestic Violence virtually later this month, October 25th through 28th. Uh, registration closes October 14th, and for those that are attending this webinar, we are offering a discount to consumer advocate attendees. So the current rate I think is over $900. You can register today for 752, but you need to email me at gshaw at ncadv.org for that code. So some of the topics that will be covered at the conference uh, include activism, social justice, community outreach. Uh, we'll be going into depth on co coercive control, creating holistic justice for survivors. We'll be talking a lot about domestic violence and fi uh, firearms, how COVID-19 has completely changed service delivery in the domestic violence field. We'll also be talking about um, anti-oppression, social justice, uh, children, teens, young adults, cultural implications of domestic violence in many, many more topics. So if you're able to attend, I highly recommend it. It's an incredible conference. And I know we have a lot of domestic violence advocates on this college. I was quite pleased to see. So 
Additionally, thank you for addressing this topic during the month of October. As many, if not all of you know, domestic violence, or October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And we certainly are encouraging people to do your part to raise awareness. We've made that easy for you by creating our Power Up Toolkit, which can be obtained at ncadv.org forward slash 2020 DVAM. So in here, you'll have idea, be given ideas and suggestions for Domestic Violence Awareness Month and how you can raise awareness during COVID-19. We put into your hands statistics, graphics, uh, links to blog posts and fact sheets. We include samples and templates. So we make it very easy for people to engage their own networks and communities around the topic. And um, I can't stress enough how important it is to have as many people as possible do this, particularly now during COVID-19, because survivors do need your help. So in 2019, the National Domestic Violence, uh, National Coalition Against Domestic Violence partnered with the National Network to End Domestic Violence in Santander Bank. Uh, around Santander Bank's project called Someone Else's Shoes. Um, they, Santander came to us because they were struck by the UN declaring that the most dangerous place in the world for a woman is her home. And that is absolutely true, but financial abuse keeps survivors particularly trapped. And I wanna play this short video, which I'm really hoping works today. Oops, it's not gonna work for us, so. Oh, darn it. Um, all right, anyway, this what this um, illustration would have shown is how difficult it is for a victim to just pick up and leave um, or escape her abuser because financial abuse is one of the primary ways that abusers keep their victims trapped in the relationship. So as Mr. Stanley talked about, there are a number of, um, you know, newer statistics coming to the forefront around uh, domestic violence. However, some of these that I list here are um, a little bit older. I'm sorry, I've got to pull this up. Um, so those on the left, the six squares are, are pulled directly from our Domestic Violence Awareness Month Toolkit, but they're still quite impactful. So as you can see in the US, an average of 20 people experience intimate partner violence every minute in this country. So that equates to more than 10 million abuse victims annually. And as most of you know, the majority of you, I think are, are very well versed in this topic, but domestic violence is prevalent in any community. It affects all people regardless of uh, age, race, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, gender, religion or nationality. Um, what you may not know is 65% of all mur murder suicides are perpetrated by intimate partners, which is shocking and terrifying. Um, and of course, between 21 to 60% of victims of intimate partner violence lose their jobs due to reasons stemming from abuse. So um, some of the early information that came out around um, COVID-19 and domestic violence are listed here. So I haven't seen like any one fact sheet put together, but I have seen some pieces of information pulled together. So I think it is a little bit early to get those hard numbers and it may be a while before we actually see those hard statistics. Um, but again, to reiterate what Mr. Stanley said, uh, the National Domestic Violence Hotline reported a 15% increase in contacts um, around COVID-19. So callers were saying that an abuser was using COVID-19 to further control them and abuse. Um, and then, of course, the resources were dwindling because shelter programs had to completely flip the way that they were doing in providing services. And, what that included was um, going totally virtually, virtual, providing virtual services. Um, also, as you can see, a survey was done of survivors across the United States and Puerto Rico, <laughs> excuse me, that said that 94 had experienced economic exploitation, 96 experienced uh, economic abuse, and then 95 experienced economic restriction. Um, and again, the, uh, in a separate survey, 
of service providers, 40% of survivors mentioned concerns about uh, receiving their stimulus check. And I'll touch upon that briefly a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, and of course, 100% of service providers reported that survivors were having challenges with money and resources specifically due to the, due the, to the pandemic. But of course, that's no surprise. 78% uh, were saying they were having trouble getting food and 54% reported that they could not uh, pay their bills. What's interesting, and Mr. Uh, Stanley did a fantastic job of um, illustrating the increase in calls uh, to pro, you know, domestic violence hotlines universally. But what I thought was quite interesting here in the United States is although we've seen it increase personally it didn't increase in the numbers that i was expecting to see um also and this is totally anecdotal but um we have been working with a partner recently to survey shelter programs nationally and after uh, you know the quarantine restrictions started to lift many uh there wasn't as much of a surge for uh, survivors reaching out for services as we had originally anticipated. So while metropolitan cities certainly saw more of an increase, rural communities are reporting that they're not seeing quite so uh, dramatic of a surge. And personally, I find that quite terrifying because what that tells me, and perhaps I'm making assumptions, is that there are just fewer and fewer resources available and that uh, victims of domestic violence are, are far more stuck than we may have even originally anticipated. Um, as touched upon, it's really common for abuser, or I'm sorry, victims to uh, be dependent on their abusers uh, for financial stability, and it makes it nearly impossible sometimes for them to escape. Um, as Mr. Stanley also spoke to, firearm purchases have increased exponentially which is again incredibly terrifying to me um and you may or may not know but in homes where there is a gun and domestic violence is present uh, victims have are 400 to 500 percent more likely to be killed with that firearm so it is incredibly dangerous for victims um you know i would say venture to say that very high numbers of victims are killed using firearms um, and the fact that rates are increasing around this purchase is, is alarming so i did want to take a minute to talk a bit about domestic violence and i know many of you are very well versed in this topic and mr stanley did a fantastic job describing the defining it for um, his terminology again domestic violence intimate partner violence is uh, commonly interchanged in this field uh, i tend to use domestic violence uh, just personally it doesn't mean that it's specific to one definition although the way that we describe it uh, it's a pattern of behaviors used by one partner to maintain power and control of other of over another partner in an intimate relationship. And the key here for me is to really stress that domestic violence and abuse is an absolute choice of one person to abuse another. So although, again, Mr. Stanley did a fantastic job showing the incidents where there were increases in reports of domestic violence. Those are certainly true, but domestic violence is a crime of access. So, for example, during COVID-19, their abuser has, you know, in most cases, 24-7 access to their victim, and they will use any tactic in their wheelhouse to maintain that control and further the abuse. Additionally, uh, abusers of domestic violence are very specific about who they abuse. So it's not as if the Super Bowl or you know a soccer tournament causes an abuser to lose control. Because in my opinion, abusers don't ever lose control. They just take advantage of situations to further torture their victims. 
Um, and I think the uh, stat that was used earlier on in this presentation is probably a little bit more current than the one that I reference here. So as you can see, domestic violence is incredibly common. Uh, one in four women and one in 10 men, at least according to this last statistic, uh, experience sexual violence, physical violence, and are stalking by an intimate partner during their lifetime. Um, and then they have an impact related to that abuse, such as, of course, concerns for their safety, commonly PTSD, uh, long-term injury, and then the psycho, uh, you know, psychological impact such as depression or uh, long-term stress. And as many of you know, I wish there was a way to share. Uh, I would love to hear from the audience some of the things that they have heard happening uh, for victims in their own communities. But some of the, the things that we have heard is um, what abusers are doing is becoming more aggressive with their abusers or with their victims, I'm sorry. So to reiterate what Mr. Stanley said early on, um, although we may not be seeing as dramatic of an increase in reporting as some of the other countries have seen, what we are hearing is that the severity of abuse is increasing. And that is particularly alarming because Mr. Shanley's right, the more severe the abuse, the more lethal that abuser um, potentially is to their victim. So how abusers have been uh, furthering abuse using COVID-19, for example, uh, we've heard that a victim report that her abuser was forcing her to wash excessively to the point where she was bleeding and developed injury as a result. They may be confine confining members of the family to certain parts of the home because uh, with concern about COVID-19 or just using COVID-19 to further keep them trapped. They're disabling phone and internet, so they're preventing uh, their intimate partner or their families from working remotely or attending school. They may be racking up debt by going you know, overboard with purchasing uh, supplies such as toilet paper, food, stockpiling um, supplies for fear of what may come in the future with COVID-19. We're seeing them manipulate parenting and custody exchanges with kids. So for example, in cases of shared custody, some abusers are refusing to allow their victim to see their children um, or refusing to take kids because of a risk of illness uh, or using the COVID-19 to say they're scared to take the kids, not help out with childcare. Um, they may be participating in risky behavior, so going to extreme lengths to interact with other people, catch the virus themselves, or with the idea of passing it on to their victim, uh, their children, or other loved family members. They may be refusing to wear masks or hand sanitizers. They may be preventing their victim from working or sabotaging work. Uh, they may be faking systems, they may be forcing extreme social distancing, so further isolating their victim, which is a very common tactic abusers use. Um, they may be denying the pandemic or on the opposite extreme, using the isolation is just, you know, they're just following orders. And of course, they may be blaming the victim for exposing, um, exposing them to COVID-19. What they also tend to be doing is they are threatening to kick the survivor and their family, their kids out of the house. Um, they might be threatening to withhold medical care or, you know, again, forbidding or making it absolutely impossible for the victim to leave. And unfortunately, we have seen uh, domestic violence programs struggle to adjust. So, Victims, again, may not have, they may be um, being surveyed by their abuser 24 seven, so they may not have the same opportunities they've had in the past to call a hotline, for example, from their place of employment, or, uh, you know, if they attend school at school, their access to family members and friends for escape may no longer be an option because they're fearful of either uh, infecting those loved ones or 
potentially catching the virus themselves. Um, shelter programs, again, have had to move to nearly all virtual service delivery, at least initially. I think some of those restrictions may be loosening and uh, shelter programs and domestic violence advocates are just incredibly creative and astute at adjusting ways that they provide service delivery. So they've gone to extreme lengths to make shelter programs um, safe for those within shelter, uh, although not all necessarily offer shelter programs or have the ability to do so. So also um, domestic violence victims may be afraid to go into shelter uh, for fear of catching the virus or exposing their children. So those are some of the ways courts have had to redo the way that they delivered services. So initially, at least, it was uh, a bit of a, a slow process to get, for example, um, you know, divorces approved or further ways to get, away, you know, ways that uh, victims were trying to escape their abusers. All right, so as we've reiterated, the number one reason survivors stay in or return to an abuser is because they can't afford to stay safe. So for many of the reasons that uh, I just talked about, what you may not know is that 73% of survivors reported staying with their abuser longer because they couldn't afford to leave. And on average, that was two years longer because it took them that long to either create a plan or gather the resources they needed to safely get away from their abuser. Also, uh, financial abuse is incredibly expensive. It certainly occurs in 99% of all instances uh, of intimate partner violence. And the CDC estimates that the costs for a cisgender female survivor um, across her life, lifetime is $104,000. That's insane. So leaving is not just as easy as um, some people just assume. Also for cisgender males, the cost to escape in a, an abusive uh, partner is 23,000. Unfortunately for uh, the trans and gender non-conforming communities, that data doesn't exist at this point. So what is financial economic abuse and what does it look like? So that can manifest in, for example, an abuser applying for credit cards, obtaining loans or opening accounts in a victim's name without their knowledge or consent. It can mean racking up debt in a partner's name without their knowledge, uh, forging a partner's name on checks and financial documents, refinancing a home mortgage or car loan without a victim's knowledge, denying their partner access to family income, such as bank accounts or credit cards, making their partner ask for money. So um, controlling every dime that's spent and certainly controlling their victim's access to how they obtain that money. They may steal or demand the partner's money. Uh, they may make a partner account for every expenditure. And I've heard some really terrifying stories in my past about how they do this. Um, they may refuse to pay utilities or never pay utilities. They may evict a partner from the home and that partner ends up homeless. They may manipulate immigration issues. So if a person is here undocumented, their complications um, are tenfold when it comes to escaping their abuser. Also, they may refuse to pay child support or withhold it. Um, they may file an accurate income and uh, deny appropriate amounts of supports to, you know, provide less child support to their victim. They commonly steal a partner's credit, debit, or ID cards. They may refuse to sign divorce papers and prolong the divorce uh, process. We, we see this commonly, and it's not something that I think uh, is commonly listed under financial abuse, but we hear about it all the time. That, uh, the abusive partner will drag their victim through the family court process if they share custody of ch children. So they file retaliatory orders or they just continue to take their partner back to court uh, for fights around uh, custody. And it, that's incredibly expensive. They often cause their partner to be late to work or miss work or school, either by beating their, them up, keeping them up all night, harassing those, their victim at work. Um, they may refuse to provide health insurance. They may refuse to assist 
in childcare. Again, they harass their partner at work or school, making it difficult for that uh, person to keep their job. And they may damage property, leaving it a victim um, to their own to fix it, their, the victim's cost. They withhold food and necessities, for example. So I was asked to go into a little more detail about uh, coerced debt. And I wanna make the a disclaimer here that this is not necessarily my area of expertise. There are organizations um, available that do really deep work around this topic specifically, and I've provided references to those. But just to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, again, it's, it's uh, one abusive partner generating debt in their partner's name without the knowledge of the other person, or if the victim may know they're, they're forcing that victim to accrue debt, um, either by, well, usually by threat of violence or other um, methods of abuse. So examples of that, of course, are taking out loans in a victim's name, using credit cards without their knowledge, um, establishing credit in a victim's name without their knowledge, threatening or forcing a victim to take out um, a loan or establish credit, putting bills in victim's names and then uh, refusing to pay those bills or not paying those bills. Again, dragging uh, their victim through court processes where they, uh, the victim has no other choice in many cases other than, than to accrue a large amount of legal debt. And of course, uh, the impact that has is an abuser may default or force a victim to default on a loan or payment. Uh, that abuser may amass large debt in a victim's name or forces that victim to am amass large uh, amounts of debt. And it, it completely straps victims financially. So victims often find themselves in a situation where they can't pay that debt or they are forced to choose which bills to pay. Uh, and of course it ruins a victim's credit. So, which leads to making, uh, finding alternative housing difficult or getting other loans, for example, a car loan, very, very difficult. Uh, and of course a victim may not know that financial abuse is occurring and they find out inadvertently, they see a bill or they receive a phone call from a, a creditor. And that may be the first instance where they've actually heard of this debt. Um, also, an ab abusers are incredibly clever in the way that they abuse. So um, that victim may be truly fearful of the consequence that they'll suffer as a result of not doing what the abuser is forcing them to do. Uh, and in custody cases, what we see, it's really about continuing uh, the abuse and continuing access to their victim. Um, it's you know, I'm sure in some cases about the kids, but what we find is that abusers often use children to further um, control their victims. So how do you combat coerced debt? Well, you know, even in the situations with, uh, with COVID-19, the strategies and dynamics haven't changed. It just may be that those resources look a little bit different. So we always recommend, and I should iterate that we um, don't provide direct services. We're more of an educational organization, but we direct people to the National Domestic Violence Hotline. If you don't already have a relationship with your local domestic violence program, you can always call the National Domestic Violence Hotline to connect directly with um, a trained advocate who is very skilled at creating a variety of different safety plans for victims of domestic violence. Um, and again, if you haven't connected with your local domestic violence program, I, I strongly suggest you do so. They're a wonderful resource. And if, if you are outside of the domestic violence movement and are working with someone who you think is being abused, they'll prove to be an incredible uh, resource for you. If that isn't an option, just please keep in mind that you need to center the needs and the ideas of the victim as best you can. Victims know their abusers best and they are going to have, in most cases, the best ideas as to how to stay and remain safe from their abuser. But of course, a victim's safety is paramount at all times, so they should never jeopardize their own safety, for example, going back to uh, a home where the abuser may still be and they've recently escaped. Uh, 
um, just to obtain documents or um, you know get information that may be helpful to them in their future. Uh, again, they can work with a domestic violence advocate to create a safety plan to go back at another time and get those that information. What you should suggest um, if you're working to a victim, if you're working directly with them, is that they avoid using any credit cards or debit cards or even location apps on their cell phones because an abuser can track their location. Um, those that do have access to credit cards or debit cards or bank accounts can change their pins. They can transfer um, or create you know, any new assets into a personal account that an abuser can't access. And you know, depending on the situation, they may need to assess whether they need an entirely new social security number, which um, again, I'm not very well versed on, but I know that domestic violence advocates can help and the local uh, social security office can help. If it's possible uh, for a victim to do so, they should you know, work to pay off any existing credit card balances, um, reestablishing, gaining or, re or establishing credit. Of course, it's gonna be paramount to their future safety and their future financial um, mobility. Of course, they close jointly on bank accounts. Um, they can ask to have their names removed from the account depending on the situation. They can send copies of court orders to credit reporting agencies, credit card companies. They can dispute fraudulent charges, set up fraud alerts to keep watch that the abuser is not continuing to use their finances to abuse them. Uh, they can change account information, uh, terminate any old leases or utilities, and then of course explore legal remedies, which are n at least what we hear, they're never enough. And I wish that you know there were so many additional uh, resources for pro bono representation available because survivors certainly need it. Um, two agencies that I highly recommend you explore in more detail. The Center for Survivor Agency and Justice does fantastic work around combating course debt and they have just a myriad of information available on their website. And then if you're ever working with someone around child custody and domestic violence, uh, the Battered Women's Justice Project does really good work on this issue. Um, it's a very complicated issue and one that we hear of almost as commonly as um, financial abuse. So housing and domestic violence, I do have to say in full transparency, this is definitely not my area of expertise. So I will do my best <laughs> to point you in the direction of some really good resources around uh, housing and domestic violence. Again, uh, the strategies and dynamics of abuse haven't changed in this realm regarding COVID-19 and, ha and uh, housing. If anything, it's just exacerbated the situation. Um, and these statistics I list are certainly older than COVID, but I still think they're quite applicable. So housing instability is four times more likely for women who have experienced domestic violence. And one in four homeless women cite domestic violence as a major contributor to their homelessness. Of homeless women with children, over 80% have experienced domestic violence. And of course, COVID-19 statistics in housing related to domestic violence are forthcoming. Um, of course, shelter after the shelter in place orders have been lifted. Uh, domestic, some domestic violence programs have experienced a surge in survivors reaching out for help. So, of course, we're assuming that homelessness is increasing as a result, that those numbers are uh, increasing in, for the need for shelter, need for housing. And of course, it's really hard. Before COVID, affordable housing was hard to access. So. I'm sure the virus has made that just um, all the worse, unfortunately. So again, I wanted to list some organizations that are doing fantastic work on this topic. And here are some resources for prevention and support. So I see that I'm coming up on my hour, so I'm gonna wrap this up and go more quickly. Always call the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Work closely with the domestic violence uh, advocate to create a financial safety plan. Again, the Centers for Survivor Agency and Justice is doing some great work around st the stimulus check and how 
abuse, or I'm sorry, victims can access um, some remedy if they haven't received their or they received theirs or their abuser is manipulating uh, that check. Um, of course, uh, let's see, this is the end of my presentation. So these list a number of resources available for you regarding domestic violence, economic justice, and financial education and empowerment. So thank you very much. I think that leaves a few minutes for questions and I'll be happy to answer all that I can. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stanley and Michelle for such dynamic presentations. And thank you for the work that you are doing. We're so glad that you are out there on the front line. Uh, let me turn it over now to Nelson for questions. We want to hear from you now. Nelson, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, if you can hear me. Um, we have, have been asked, um, what are some ways to advocate for more protections for, uh, for victims? Oh, if, if there are agencies working on this? Yes. Yes, there are numerous agencies. So if you join the national, if you join our um, email list via ncadv.org, we send out um, action alerts quite commonly around uh, legislation that is uh, specifically geared toward protecting victims of domestic violence. Uh, the other organization I would recommend, I'm sorry, let me pull it up, is the National Low Income Housing Coalition. I think the House just recently may have passed another stimulus package. Of course, that's not at my fingertips at this point, but call your members of Congress and organizations like NCADB and the National Low Income Housing Coalition can provide you with specific language you can use when either emailing, tweeting, or uh, calling your members of Congress that make it will make your life easy. So we put that information just directly in your hands. And, you know, if I can add to that, uh, one thing I would recommend is if you have friends or family members who are attorneys, you should just, and you have a situation you think might need to be addressed. Ms. Shaw mentioned that she wishes there was more access to justice for these issues. Reach out and see if someone will take something pro bono. I can't tell you the amount of times that I'm so, so busy and someone has a case pro bono and someone asks me, can I do it? And I just have a really hard time saying no. And I know other attorneys can, can help. So consider, you know, family, friends, anyone who is an attorney, they could always offer pro bono help. And if you ask, they might say yes. And it really does make a difference to have an attorney involved. So just, just something to throw out there. It does. That's wonderful. Thank you. And another question we have is, are, are financial institutions uh, aware of some of the problems and what kind of protections may be available uh, in terms of if they are catching financial abuse when it happens or, or aware of it? Um, I would say that some are, and I think it's up to the, just the, probably the the bank itself is to how flexible they'll be. But uh, again, the Sur their Center for Survivor Agency and Justice has specific, specific information geared towards how um, people can negotiate debt or uh, relief with banks on their website. So I can direct you, I'm sorry, I don't have that at my fingertips, but just go to the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice and they have a search field there that will pull up just an incredible amount of information. Excellent, thank you. Somebody is asking, if is there a code that housing counselors can use to help domestic violence victims uh, by referring them to a hotline? Is there a code? Yeah, um, that's. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of a code. So, you know, for example, the code that or the sign that was generating in the UK, I have not heard that about that taking on here. Now, I could be wrong, but to the extent that I know there isn't really a code, they should, if they're aware of it, I would hope they would just be able to directly refer uh, that victim. Great, thank you. Uh, how somebody's asking, how does one volunteer to be an advocate for a domestic violence victim? Connect lo with your local domestic violence program. Most uh, domestic violence programs have 
training, for example, I started my career as a, a hotline volunteer in Alabama just way back in the day. And I had to go through some great extensive training on the topic of domestic violence. So I'd highly suggest you start there. Uh, somebody commented here. Have you noticed with the pan? Have you noticed? I guess with the pandemic, if is there m more money available for domestic violence victims? Like if they're needing to stay in hotels, the money to move things to storage for down payment uh, for first month's rent for a new place. No, um, I wish is I more could. Is money available, yeah. or is less money available? I, well, I wish the answer was yes to that. Um, no, <laughs> if anything, I think most victims of domestic violence can access those resources through their local domestic violence program. Um, and unfortunately, those programs have probably lost traction on funding. So for example, um, if a program was dependent on an annual dinner or live event to bring in a large portion of their annual budget. Those events may have either gone online and been less successful or they've been forced to cancel them because of concerns uh, with catching the virus. So um, unfortunately, domestic violence programs are really struggling as well. And it was tight before the, the pandemic and it's not that's one of the things I think our um, policy department is working on is to try to get Congress to approve more funds. Uh, to yeah, I, I would I would programs. agree with that. As I mentioned, that one organization I represent, uh, their year their annual donor, their biggest donor, uh, shifted funds into public health related things instead instead of domestic violence. And and they're exactly what Ms. Shaw said. They're a usual fundraising initiative. It's all different now. It's all online, and it's a bit different. So I think she's totally correct that I, unfortunately the answer is I think as far as public like uh, donations are going at least, that's all I can speak to. Those seem to be uh, less than, than normal, unfortunately. Yeah. Great. Thank you to both of you. Um, someone is asking, how can we educate the court system about abusers using the courts to harass and abuse the victim? <laughs> Um, wow, that's a, that's an interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, honestly, we've been trying. We as a movement have been trying to do that for years, and there are, um, if you have relationships with judges within those courts, invite them to have a conversation. Or if you know of a conference where the topic of custody, for example, is being presented, ask them personally to attend. I know. Um, we as an organization uh, hold, as again, hold a national conference every year. And in most cases in the past, we've been able to hold sessions related to custody and domestic violence and have invited the legal community and judges in particular, family court judges to those conversations and they're not very well attended. Um, so training is, is key, but unfortunately, it's really hard to get the audience there. Thank you, then. Uh, thanks for that. Someone is asking, what is the correlation between the rates of domestic violence and child abuse? Um, I, they're very closely associated. I don't have any statistics off the top of my head, but they usually coexist. Um, Abusers often use children to hurt and control their victims. So it is not uncommon in you know households where domestic violence may be present for child abuse to also be present. So unfortunate. That's unfortunate. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And while I don't have any statistics in front of me either, I know during my research for this presentation, I did see several reports that violence against children have, have also increased during this pandemic and it's, you know, the domestic issue within the household. So definitely seen some increases there as well. Uh, we, we also just received a comment and this is maybe something that we can share by email with everyone attending later, uh, if, if it's uh, maybe relevant to them. Somebody works at a social service agency, which does help with response rent and security deposits. And she recommends checking out 
uh, county social service agencies for this service. Uh, and we'll reach out to her so that we can let others know if, if that's an agency that may be able to help them. Um, but in terms of additional questions, I'm sorry, was there a comment from the panelists? No, I just said that's fantastic. I'm glad they suggested that. Thank you. Yes, and we will share what we what we learned. Um, what more are you learning about elder abuse victims and COVID? Uh, folks say numbers are up. Uh, so the speaker, the questioner says, I run an elder abuse program and our phones are nearly silent while our domestic violence younger cases are skyrocketing in my agency. Mm. Um, I haven't seen statistics specific to that, um, but would recommend you connect with the, um, it's called the National Clearinghouse for Abuse in Later Life, so NCAL. Um, I don't know if there's a way I can share it with the, organizers, at least in the chat. So ncall.org. ncall.org? Yes. ncall.org. And we can send it also by email later, but I'll go ahead and just uh, send to all that, that URL you just gave us. Great. Someone is asking uh, about, I think uh, it was you, Michelle, who mentioned an upcoming event. The question is, is the upcoming webinar virtual as well? So we haven't mentioned our webinars yet. We're going to mention them in a moment, but. Right, so it's actually, I'm sorry. It's actually our national conference. And yes, that's completely virtual. If you email me at, uh, and I'll share this with the organizers. So my email is gshaw at ncadv.org. I can send you more information. Great, and we, they'll get the slides within the next day or next couple of days, so they'll have your email Great. for that too. Okay, um, fantastic. Uh, is, let me see another question here. How can someone who has not received their stimulus check or tax return, as there has been a mistake in her information or is, oh, I'm not sure if this, is, this relates to not receiving tax uh, stimulus, tax returns. I know there is some, some, uh, something to do with domestic violence victims not having access sometimes to these checks. Is there any comment you have on that? Um, well, I can, again, the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice is doing specific work, but I do think there is, there may be some help. I don't necessarily think it's specific to survivors of domestic violence. And I know that um, some attorneys have filed suits on behalf of victims against the abuser for stealing that check. But if you go to the IRS, at one point they had um, a tool on its website called Get My Payment. I'm not sure if that is still live and working, but you may want to check that out. Oh, sorry, I'm reading some information in front of me about the stimulus check. You can use another tool on the IRS website called Non-Filers Enter Payment Information Here. That may lead you to more information about your stimulus check. Um, let's see. You can also get tax, free tax help from a low-income taxpayer clinic, and you can search for your closest clinic using the search tool on the IRS website. Thank you, Ms. Shaw. And I, sure. we will, I'll do one last question because we are 10 minutes over time now. Uh, and this, it's really just a statement. And then if you have any additional comments, uh, it's uh, the person says, if people are getting federal housing assistance, Section 8 and or public housing, the victims can use VAWA, uh, yes. which is against the Violence Against Women, Violence Against Women's Act to get relocated and keep their housing assistance. Fabulous. That's very helpful. Uh, and that, uh, this is it for questions. There are lots of thank yous. Um, I will turn it back over to you, Linda, since we are over time. 
Thank you, Nelson. Didn't I tell you you were in for a treat? Special thanks to uh, Mr. Stanley and Ms. Shaw for dynamic presentations and for hanging in there with us and answering uh, all of those questions. And thank you um, to you for joining us today. Real quickly, I'm going to go over some upcoming events. On October the 4th, we're having a question and answer session on the CDC's order to halt evictions on November 17th check your inbox. We will have a webinar on the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health of children and protecting children's health, uh, protecting children's privacy online. I mentioned earlier that all handouts will be placed in the Dropbox and it will be made available you, to you tomorrow afternoon, where the flyer to the national conference that Michelle mentioned will also be included uh, in that Dropbox uh, as well. If you have any more additional questions, you can uh, email me. Uh, my, you, have, you should have my email address. I want to thank you for joining us today. We know you're busy, so thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. And again, Mr. Stanley, Michelle, thank you so very much for uh, being on the front line and doing the work that you're doing and for taking the time to do the webinar today. I hope I see you on October the 14th. Until then, stay safe and keep up the great work that all of you are doing out there. Thank you. Goodbye. I'm signing off now. Thank you.